Good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Rulani Edward Nguenya, um, and today we'll be discussing radiation injuries. Uh, radiation. I think last we discussed the um, electromagnetic radiation. Um, we looked at light as a portion, um, a visible portion of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum, um, which is, of course, from red all the way until violet, red being at a wavelength of about 700 to 750, and violet being at a wavelength of 300 to 380, and, of course, all the colors in between being the, 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 the visible um, portion which represents what light is. It is a visible portion of the electromagnetic um, irradiation spectrum. So now when we speak about lasers, we then go to the other side of the spectrum, which is below the raid. That would be anything that's below raid you're looking at um, infrared. So infrared is specific and infrared would then be at its own wavelength, um, which is about 750 to 1 millimeters. Remember, we measure this in nanometers. Um, this is the wavelength 750 nanometers to 1 millimeters. Below infrared is microwave which is between one millimeters to one meter. And below microwave, we then have sound, which you know runs at a wavelength of anything from one meters to a hundred kilometers. Um, and within sound, of course, we have our own um, ranges, anything below sound, infrasound, anything above sound, which is ultrasound. And in between this, is the acoustic sound or sound that we generally can hear um you know from our own human ears and this would range of course from 20 um hertz to 20,000 hertz um of frequency now let's move away from that what we are going to speak about today is radiation so we're looking at the other side of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum which is above the violet so when you look at anything from that side it's now known as ionizing radiation anything below rate non-ionizing radiation and what does that do it dis it disrupts molecules through these electrons but ionizing that's where we destroy dna so from violet we go to ultraviolet which is between um 10 nanometers to 400 nanometers this is the wavelength and then we go to x-rays x-rays it's 10 nanometers to 0 0.01 nanometers and then after x-rays now comes your gamma rays um which you know i elicited by the stone known as radium um which are less than 0 0.02 nanometers now that is ionizing radiation and that is what is used to you know and that is what actually destroys the dna so when we speak of radiotherapy what is radiotherapy radiotherapy is um, the use of this high energy ionizing electromagnetic radiation or particulate radiation um, to treat cancers. That's what it is. So we're looking at that side of the spectrum. Now, I said you can use electromagnetic radiation. Um, that is less commonly used now. I mean, looking at photons, electrons. Um, and, and in essence, now what we, what that is, is, you know, artificially produced X-rays um, and naturally um, produced gamma rays from the radium. Um, and this is, is, is produced by this disintegration of unstable atoms. We use particulate radiation um, in order to emit this. Now, remember on that side, we use laser. Laser is light, amplica light amplification by um, this stimulated emission of, of radiation. So we stimulate emission through 
different processes of 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 trying to you know um destabilize these electrons moving them from a metastable um to stable all the way to unstable and then releasing this coherent um radiant force now in this case um what we do is we 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 use um particulate radiation so what it is it's high speed particles which collide with a target uh, or targets that are inside the machine and produce radiation um you know is is then emitted um i'm giving a simplified um version of this there's more detail of course because this speaks to the physics um on a mon molecular level of of radiotherapy but just know as particulate radiation that it's high speed particles that collide with targets that are inside a machine and they produce this idea now the way we 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 put this through um um is through different modes or the the way we deliver this is through the different modes one is through external radiation this is what you call external beam radiation um and in essence what it is is basically delivering this radiation through linear um accelerator so there's this machine called a linear accelerator um that generates and delivers radiation with a greater depth um and so it would affect tissues um that are deeper more than it would the skin we can also do it internally um something known as brachytherapy brachy um from the greek um meaning short distance that's what brachy means so um we use high dose um, intracavity radiotherapy or, you know, radioactive implants that we put in, such as in prostate cancer, in the prostate brachytherapy, we put these implants and they emit this radiation. But because of the wavelength, they require, and the frequencies thereof, they require a shorter distance rather than your external beam radiation where you can transmit um, this this um, radiation or emit this radiation um, from a, a greater distance. Now, those are the means through which we, 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 we emit, call it um, radiation, the external and then the internal. Now, let's look at the, the effects of radiation. Look, the way it would be best to look at radiation would be to look at the 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 radiation effect on tumor cells and the radiation toxicity on normal cells now the way we <clears throat> we 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 um cause um some form of an effect on on cells um it can be done directly which we, we less commonly use these days, and this is a direct break to the DNA. Or we do it directly, which is what's used commonly. Now, what do we mean directly? You see, um, we radiation, which we spoke about, this radiation um, is delivered. Now, when it, it reaches in contact with water, um, it ionizes, and um, there's a reaction that happens when it ionizes water through these photons and neutrons. Um, it starts to then break this H2O um, particle, call it, into different fragments, and you get different um, byproducts that come out of this through different configurations of the H molecule and the O molecule um, coming together or separating. And so if you get the OH plus molecule, some of the byproducts, it becomes, you know, your hydroxyl um, radicals that form. 
um, H2O plus these are, you know, your excitable water. Um, we get our oxygen-free radicals um, from this. H2O2, this is peroxide, which you, we all know when you use peroxide in theater, what usually happens, it's, it comes in contact with this tissue and you get these bubbles. This is what happens in tissue level um, and you get this cytotoxic, um, call it bubbling and eruption that happens. Um, secondary to the H2O2, which is peroxide. You also get um, H+, which are hydrogen radicals, um, and also um, superoxides, which then form. This is HO2+, um, um, the superoxide. So what, in essence, all these byproducts do, um, they destroy DNA indirectly. So, Remember DNA, it's all those groups, it's your guanine strands, yeah. um, all these strands, they, if you look at the composition, it's mainly, you know, e e carbon, C, um, the O group, the H group, or occasionally you get the phosphate group. Um, so when you take all of these byproducts, you can destroy them. Um, through, you know, uh, causing these breaks, either the single or double strand breaks in this DNA or, or, or affecting the cross linkage thereof. And so if a cell is unable to divide or unable to repair, it then um, initiates this process of apoptosis. But remember, we can also by default keep this at the back of your head because that's where we're going to come. Um, through radiation, you can change the configuration of a normal cell um, e DNA and then change um, or rather effect what we know as mutation. Um, and this can be, you know, this can eventually one day lead to, to cancer. And so that's one of the, the problems of radiation. Um, but you see, the, the advantage and why we use radiation now, radiation um, or favors um, cells with high mitotic index. So it's cells that are replicating at a very fast rate. Um, we, I always make an example when you look at a tumor. You know, you look at this tumor, you look at this tumor on your skin or cancer. Now it grows up and it keeps growing more than the surrounding tissue, which is normal. So it's replicating the cells within this tumor have a high mitotic index. They replicate fast. So when you look at the, 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 the phases um, of growth, they these cells are mainly in the M phase. So they're replicating and replicating fast. So radiation attacks those ones. It's, you know, more. So that's why we are able to radiate and separate it from normal cells because we hope when we give this dose of radiation, it affects those cells rather than the normal cells. Now, mind you, by the way, you may have other normal cells which may be in their M phase. And of course, they can be destroyed um, in this process. So being cognizant of this, what do we then do? The solution is then, instead of giving this one massive dose of radiation that may blow and affect all other cells, we then say, no, 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 let's divide it. Let's fractionate this into different doses. So we take this total dose of radiation that we are supposed to give this the, the patient and we cut it into little pieces. We fractionate it to minimize the effects, to limit the dose, thus minimizing the effect on normal tissue. That's the reason we do it. I like to look at it as the, 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 the four R's um, or the four phases of um, radiation and how it affects cells. Um, I like to look at it as repair. You see, normal cells have a better healing capacity. So if we fractionate, we give them time to heal, whereas cancer cells can't heal that fast. So repair 
is one of the phases that um, assist us in this. Two, it's repopulation. You see, imagine the stack of cancer. We can't kill it all at once. So we, we, we destroy certain cells and then we get a less population. Um, we affect more and we get a lesser population. And then the next fraction more until we've got a small population that is left that we can then affect. But also what we want by it reaching, um, you know, uh, you, you can imagine these things, these cells stacked up against each other. By them, um, you know, stacking up less and less and less, they reach closer, they become closer to the blood supply because the blood supply is what we need. So the cancers that are closer to the blood supply are the ones that are going to be killed more, this being the reoxygenation. So when we have cancer cells closer to blood vessels, they are the ones that are most directed because we need the, we need them to have all this, you know, this oxygen, this water in them in order to be affected um, by these byproducts. And, 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 and so with normal um, cancer growth, you will then appreciate that radiation cannot be used for all cancers. There are indications for radiation. If you've got this large cancer, because as this cancer grows, as it grows and keeps growing, it starts, the cells start to outgrow their own blood supply. So right at the center, the core, the crux of this cancer, you will then have death that occurs. And those don't have oxygen. And so radiation cannot affect those. So it thus follows that in order for radiation to work, it would need to be a smaller cancer that has all those, um, you know, requirements that we need in order for the radiation or the superoxide to be able to work. So we would need to cut up the rest of the cancer, the large macroscopic cancer that we see, we cut it out and then we are left to irradiate those ones that may be sensitive to radiation. In other words, those which the byproducts can, um, can affect. Um, and so that is the essence of radiation. So only cells with good blood supply will be affected. The rest we then need to cut out. Now, that is how radiation affects the cancer cells. Now, remember, there's also now collateral damage that can happen. Radiation can also be toxic to normal cells. How does this happen? Remember, when we give this dose, this can uh, occur um, acutely. So acutely, what we mean is during the radiation process or directly after this radiotherapy dose has been given. Even though, remember, the, the, the effects may not be um, obvious, um, but may manifest even up to two weeks after that, we may see the results of this. The you know and 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 remember we said we directed to highly um, replicating cells. So the cells that replicate higher, such as you know your epithelium um, on your skin, your mucosa, um, those will be affected. You you would then imagine you would have erythema then forming, um, desquamation, you know mucositis uh, around the esophagus. You may have esophagitis. So those are the immediate effects. But the advantage is that these are reversible. So they will be related to the dose that we give, the size um, of the volume, and, and any radiosensitive drugs that may be on board, um, like your chemotherapy. Now, other changes may be late. Late refers to anything, you know, that's after six months um, or after the completion of radiotherapy. And now this affects cells, not that are, not the cells that are highly replicating, but the ones that replicate at a much slower pace. The ones that are unable to then re 
um, populate um, and, and, and regenerate um, like those faster ones. And so these are your connective tissues um, such as your bone, cartilage, um, the blood vessel endothelium, um, your nervous tissues will be affected. And so in essence, what you are going to get from all of this is irreparable cells if I may use that. And so they become fibrotic. Fibrosis is the hallmark of late, um, you know, toxicity um, to normal cells. And this is irreversible. Um, and it's more correlation, you know, it correlates more to the, 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 the fraction size. Um, we can quantify this damage, by the way, the, the permanent tissue um, damage. So the way we quantify this risk is, th um, is through a formula where we take the total dose that is given, the overall total dose, we times it by five. Why are we using five? Five is the acceptable percentage of tissue damage. So we accept that 5% of tissues will get damaged. So we say the total dose times five and we divide it by the number of years. Generally, you know, we look at five years survival, so we'll say divided by five. Um, and so taking this total dose times five, you divide it by the number of years, um, which in this example, we can use five. We will then have the, the quantifiable risk of permanent damage to tissues. So these are just some of the academic calculations that may be used. Now, tissue damage can happen at a local level, but there can be radiation, um, you know, e toxicity at a systemic level or systems level. So looking at the local effects, the local tissue damage of radiation, we can break it down from skin, we can look at the muscle, we can look at the bone, we can even look at the, the mucosa, the damage that it does, and the lymphatics, because one of the things you can get is destruction of the lymphatic system. And so these patients um, end up with lymph edema. Um, certainly we have that in patients who had a modified radical mastectomy or forgot it. Let's say a patient who had breast conserving surgery um, who has um, a sentinel, um, who has a, 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 a follow-up um, lymph node dissection or rather does not even have a follow-up lymph node dissection um, axillary but has radiation to that region, those patients may have lymphedema still to the arm um, because of obstruction to the lymphatics. So let's look at the skin. What happens in the skin? S basically, what we then have is apop you know, um, apoptotic um, cell death. That's what happens. We have an acellular or rather a hypocellular area um, that is around them. But further to this, if you've got this and you've got a wound there, you're not going to be able to heal. This is certainly going to affect wound healing. And I mean, if you go back and you think of the wound healing um, process, as you, as you remember, we're not going to be touching on these. These are the very basics. Um, your hemostasis, your inflammatory phase, your proliferative phase, and your remodeling phase that happens from three months up until 18 months. Um, we... Radiation affects each of those phases individually. I mean, let's just look at the inflammatory phase. Radiation can prolong the inflammatory phase. What it, what it does is that it, it increases um, the production of these inflammatory cytokines. And so this wound never heals. Um, and, and it also affects the extracellular matrix. And so what we get is increase in fibrosis. Further to this, because we are not able to heal well, we can't um, even target or prevent infections. And so this becomes a problem. Looking at the proliferative phase, it, it delays this phase. 
how remember the proliferative phase if you remember it it was divided into um neovascularization fibroplasia um what other epithelialization was one of those so we've said here we've killed the epithelial cells so you're not going to get any epithelialization um because of the apop the apoptosis the cell death that then happened ap apoptosis um and so your contact inhibition it's not going to happen you're going to have a wound that never is going to close um and and regarding the fibroblast the fibroplasia um you it limits or rather decreases fibroblasts and the growth factors that are associated with that remember with macrophages there are growth factors that initiate the process of proliferation um but the growth factors such as you know your 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 tumor necrotic factor alpha um ifn those ones are affected um they are decreased by radiation and so this prevents um in essence this collagen deposition and so it limits granulation moreover if you look at the vascular side of things it decreases um with the endothelial damage um the cell apoptosis that you get we we then co have breakages in that this can cause thrombosis this can eventually even cause occlusion and so we have this end arteritis where the vessels that are, are are there that are supposed to assist in um neovascularization you know where it would sprout from are dead and so you can't get neovascularized and so you in essence have this ischemic this hypoxic this hypocellular wound that will never heal remodeling in itself is halted i mean further to that we have a decrease in the mmps um by decreasing the fibroblasts and so you're going to get a decrease in angiogenesis a decrease in the migration decrease epithelialization and further this decreases the remodeling phase so where our type um you know three collagen um converted to type one collagen so this is not going to happen and so we we we're going to get a non-healing wound those are the effects on wound healing effects on the skin i mean the muscles themselves can be fibrotic um the bone itself can start to fracture the, the i mean let let alone the myelosuppression that can happen and so herein we get entities such as osteoradionecrosis where you have this necrotic um or open wound that's close to irradiated irradiated bone that that doesn't heal um and this you know can be three to six months after radiation um and of course in the absence of a recurrence and this we define as osteoradionecrosis and there are phases type one type two type three depending on the days 21 days etc um and and the healing i mean the protocols um or the stages as per max um that exist in that regard now i'm not going to go further into that um systemically i just want to say look there are other issues that can be affected on the central nervous system you can have brain lesions and cephalopathy of the brain stem hearing loss or tightest media respiratory system um we can have radiation pneumonitis lung fibrosis um the the, the central nervous system of course you can have um atherosclerosis um a cardiomyopathy you can have and pericardial fibrosis can follow git um from the mouth we can take it with mouth ulcers going all the way to the git where you may have um fistulas stenosis um even mucosal irritation that can cause you know your pr bleeding or diarrhea um, and then the gastrourinary tract is also affected, cystitis, nephropathy, um, vagina, you can get stenosis. Um, besides stenosis, it can affect, you know, um, sexual dysfunction with the dryness and even, um, you know, cause women to enter into menopause by affecting the ovaries that are there. So, and of course, the future effects of the cancer um, that can then come in essence you know um the word one can use um when one thinks of radiation um is a phrase that i've come to love that radiation is actually a gift that keeps on giving 
it keeps on giving. It doesn't stop giving. It will give and give and give and give. The effects keep going on way after the initial dose. Years after it's been given, it keeps giving. And those can be problematic. And so we need to manage this. How do we manage it? Of course, you want to prevent it. You want to limit the dose. You want to shield the normal tissues. But when you have it, here's a patient who comes with a radiation injury there. Um, you look at, I don't know, the patient had a cancer. It was radiated many years before. And then they're there in front of you and they've got this non-healing ulcer. You've biopsied it. You've excluded recurrence. You, you, you are certain that this is a chronic wound secondary to radiation. Now, how are you going to manage this patient? And of course, the way we always look at general management where you, you look at the nutritional needs of the patient guided by markers such as albumin. Um, some would add pharmacological treatment such as your pento um, pentoxifilin, which is a methyl xanthine derivative that that increases oxygenation, it's there. Um, we don't use it in our practice. Um, but when you have your wound bed there, you want, um, and it's and it's septic, maybe it may be full of slough, we want to decrease the infection um, or the slough, we may do so chemically um, with chemical debriding agents um, and, and surgical debridement. Um, we also go and quite conservatively there. Um, an adjunct, which we will use, which we can talk about, is hyperbaric oxygen as well. We use it as per the MAX um, protocol. But in essence, what you're going to do is that tissue, after you've optimized that wound, the patient, you will need to excise it. You know, others may say, I'm going to put a vac dressing. Vac dressing, look, there's controversy in a vac dressing because what are you trying to do? The way vac um, or negative pressure wound therapy works um, is, of course, one, decreasing edema, okay. Um, decreasing bacterial load, um, okay, because when a wound is, you know, bacterial load is greater than 10 to the power of 5, it's not going to heal fine. Um, but what else are you going to do? On a macro level, you're going to try to um, bring the wound closer. Highly unlikely if you have an excise that core fine too because that's stiff um that you know the wound edges are stiff um they're fibrotic and number two you say okay what on a on a mechanical micro mechanical level um i'm going to stimulate new um vascularization you won't because you've got an arteritis the vessels that you rely on are not there for that neovascularization to happen, you need vessels from which this will sprout from. Um, and so you don't have, and so that's one of the controversies of um, the negative wound um, therapy. Um, so we are diverting. But eventually what you're going to need to do is excise the ulcer, excise the surrounding radiated tissue and reconstruct. How are you going to reconstruct? Are you going to use local flaps, regional flaps? No. You try to run away and go for skin on the or, or tissue on a distant site that is far away from the radiated area and then you can bring it there, um, you know, in different forms, form of a free flap. Lab, um, you can bring that distant skin on that side. Okay, so those are some of the ways um, of, of, of dealing with it. Quickly touching on hyperbaric oxygen, since we mentioned it, um, in essence, succinctly, it's just administering 100% oxygen above atmospheric pressure. So you give this and an atmospheric pressure between 2 to 2.5 atmospheres, for a specified period. That's all hyperbaric oxygen is. And the way it works, I'll, just, I'll, I'll break it down into five. First, hyperoxygenation. What you do, you increase capillary oxygen tension, you increase the plasma, um, you know, dissolved, or rather the, 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 the distance, um, your, your oxygenation diffusion distance, and you decrease your, your plasmin dissolved oxygen. And so you hyperoxygenate the field. And we know in order for a wound to heal, you would like to have an oxygenated bed. Generally, it's between 30 to 50 millimeters mercury, um, a PaO2 that is ideal for healing. And so what? how else does it work? Vasoconstriction. By vasoconstriction, we decrease edema. Works very well. Neovascularization, it says, look, as a cellular response to the cytokines, indeed, you can get an increase um, 
it gives you know it comes with this increase um, in replication and formation of new vessels so neovascularization is one of the functions um, or rather the benefits of 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 um, hyperbaric oxygen but also of course keeping a clean wound um, by improving the cell killing ability remember leukocytes kill via an oxygen dependent pathways and and so um, you you want the the, the, the wound bed to have ideal um, or optimal oxygen between 30 and 40 um, partial pressure and um, that will will enhance by the way hyperbaric oxygen in itself has a direct bactericidal and bacteriostatic um you know effect bactericidal some of the ano anaerobes are affected you know even bacteriostatic things like pseudomonas um are affected and of course our our assistance in the macrophages and then just lastly um not specifically for these wounds but like in patients with decompressive illnesses um with the pressure um gas gradient you know you may you are able to decrease the bubble size of gas in the blood and so it assists with decompressive illnesses but in plastic surgery where can we apply hyperbaric oxygen because we are plastic surgeons now we can apply it in radiation injury we are here that's what we are talking about chronic non-healing wounds um things such as osteomyelitis necrotizing infections like necrotizing fasciitis um burns flaps you know, for our flaps, for, for preparation of our wound bed, hyperbaric oxygen comes in. Even post-operatively, we use hyperbaric oxygen to assist us. We also use it when we want to salvage um, compromised flaps or for reimplantation. So those are some of the uses of it. And how are we going to use it? Remember I said, here's a patient coming in with this radiated ulcer. We are going to excite, optimize the wound. We want to excise, um, but as per Max principle or Max protocol um, with our adjunct of hyperbaric oxygen. And what Max protocol is, let's quickly touch on it. You give 100% oxygen at two atmospheres for 121 minutes per day. Or at 2.4 atmospheres at 90 minutes per day. So in total, what you give is, a, is, is 30. So it's a 2010 rule. What you do, you give 20 sessions. You must have 20 sessions preoperatively. You operate on the patient and then give 10 sessions postoperatively to complete um, this MAX protocol. And this has shown good results in terms of wound healing for irradiated um, areas, such as even when you're operating a patient with osteoradial necrosis um, or irradiated wound. Um, look, there are patients you are not going to use, of course, you know, hyperbaric oxygen. Um, so there are contraindications. I mean, because remember, hyperbaric oxygen, you can give it either in a single chamber unit, a patient goes into this chamber, um, they are alone there, or a multi-chamber where there's more patients um, who can enter this chamber. But it's a closed environment. So people with um, claustrophobia are not going to be able to be there. Now, being a closed chamber and giving this high um, level of energy, you're not going to give this to a patient with a pneumothorax, to a patient with um, COPD or asthma. Patients with a previous history of seizures, it may be a problem because one of the complications might be to the central nervous system seizures. You're not going to put a pregnant patient or a neonate into this chamber also, um, contraindications are patients with optic neuritis or if, even if a patient has a cancer currently. Because remember, we spoke about cancer, we spoke about radiation, what it does. So now you want to put this patient and give them, um, you know, radio, i.e. hyperbaric oxygen. Um, it goes against the basic principles. And of course, you know, because remember, you are increasing the affinity um, of oxygen there. Um, so you, 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 if you have patients with spherocytosis, um, it is a contraindication, um, to those. Complications are obvious. It may be parotoma, oxygen toxicity, such as the central nervous system, pulmonary system, cataracts is one of them. And of course, fires, um, we, you know, it's something we tend to forget, but fires are some of the things. So, that's succinctly um, radiation. 
um, how it may present, how we deal with it, um, and the basic physics of radiation. I hope this lecture was useful um, for you, and I hope it can benefit you in having a better understanding of radiation and understanding that whenever you're going to operate on a patient, um, radiation is this gift that will keep on giving. So when you do um, operate and then you are going to irradiate on, this, on the flap, just know the effects that are going to come. It may look good now, but in the long term, um, you know, it may not look so good. But of course, radiation is improving um, as we keep going. But the physics, it's important, I think, for every plastic surgeon to know um, the physics of radiation in order to assist. Have a good day and take care.